Let's get started. So uh, welcome everyone to the last iFi Colloquium of spring 2021. Uh, my name is Jesse Thaler and I'm the director of iFi. And thanks for tuning in to this bi-weekly colloquium series. And I hope you've enjoyed these talks as much as I have, spanning a range of cutting edge developments across physics and AI. Um, as I said, this is the last iFi Colloquium for the spring. And while we're taking a break over the summer, we'll be back with more exciting talks this fall. Uh, I wanna take this moment to, to thank Jim Halverson for his efforts organizing this colloquium series and for serving as co-PI of iFi. Uh, but today our colloquium organizer is our colloquium speaker. So I'll be doing the invitation, uh, the uh, introduction. So it's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Jim Halverson from Northeastern University. Uh, Jim's research is at the intersection of fundamental physics, mathematics, and deep learning with a particular focus on string theory uh, and extra dimensional geometries and their implication for particle physics and cosmology. Starting around 2017, Jim got interested in using machine learning as a way to tackle open questions in theoretical physics. And this interest solidified in 2019 with the Physics Meets ML workshop that he co-organized, which is now a successful online seminar series. Uh, also in 2019, Jim received a coveted career grant from the National Science Foundation to pursue this exciting research direction. Today, Jim is going to give us a tour of knots in natural language, highlighting the power of AI to tackle theoretical data, data sets. Uh, if you have questions during the talk, feel free to drop them in the chat and Jim will answer them in the Q&A session at the end. So please join me in welcoming Jim Haverson. All right, hello everyone. It's good to see you. It has, uh, as Jesse has already said, it's been so much fun to be meeting with you virtually uh, since I guess early February, having these bi-weekly bi -weekly colloquia. And uh, today I get to tell you about my own work and some things that I think are interesting. Uh, and in particular, I'm gonna try to tell you about ML for ab initio data. And I'll, I'll talk about what that means. In some sense, it means data from definitions. And I'm gonna, in, in particular, I'm gonna focus this on a particular type of ab initio data uh, in the context of knot theory and explain how things in knot theory are related to natural language processing, and then even use a little bit of natural language techniques, although I'll, I'll use broader techniques as well. So this is based on some work from last year with Sergei Gukov and Fabian Rula and Pyotr Solkowski. I should also mention that uh, ML for knot theory uh, is, some, is a subject that's sort of still in its infancy. So if you're interested in seeing all of the literature, uh, there are some excellent papers by Vishnu Jajala and collaborators and also Mark Hughes and collaborators. I think the, the total number of, of papers right now that uses ML for knot theory in some way is sort of five to 10 or something like that. So um, I encourage you to check out their works too. So um, I'm uh, yeah, that's the basic sketch of what I'm gonna be doing here. Uh, it, it's sort of starting with some high level stuff and then going deeper into knots. So to begin with, what I wanna ask is what is data? And to try to, as we consider ab initio data, sort of think more broadly about what it is that, that we mean by data generally. Uh, of course, we have MNIST and other famous examples in machine learning, uh, which might lead you to believe, you know, is data something that we create? Do we create it? Alternatively, in particle physics, we heard from Phil Harris, my iFi colleague earlier in the semester about using machine learning uh, for fast AI in elementary particle physics. And so you might, might ask, is data something that, that we collect? On the other hand, uh, knots, which are the subject of this talk, are something that are mathematical objects that sort of exist irrespective of any particular image representation of a knot. So with data, you might ask, do we define it? And I don't think that there's necessarily any one right answer to these uh, different questions, but I'm just pointing out that data comes in sort of different modalities of, you know, things that we might create or collect or define. And so, you know, pushing down this avenue a little bit more, you might ask, how is it that we can uh, think of a fun way to differentiate between these different types of data? And one is to ask, you know, would ET have this data? So if ET came to Earth and he had already mastered English so that we could uh, communicate uh, or, or whatever your chosen language is, so that we could communicate easily with ET, uh, you, might, you might ask, would he have this data? And it could be that we show him particle collisions from LHC and uh, he knows all about this. And he says, yes, 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 physics is translation invariant. I know physics. And uh, in particular on my planet, we uh, do proton collision experiments also. And yes, I've seen things like this before. So, so uh, you know, data like that that emerges in, in fundamental physics might be something that, that he's seen before. Um, on the other hand, uh, it could be that on uh, ET's planet, he has friends that are mathematicians and they like to define things and then look into consequences of those definitions. 
And it could be that ET has come up or his friends have come up with a mathematical definition for a knot. And so in particular, this is the simplest non-trivial knot. This is something called the trefoil, which will appear a number of times today. And it could be that ET has seen that as well. On the other hand, if you showed ET handwritten digits, he probably would recognize that these objects carry some meaning, but the fact that this is a nine and that this is a nine and that this is a nine is sort of something very specific to how we encode the more general notion of nine as humans. So ET probably wouldn't know about MNIST. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that. These are just different types of data that are out there. And in some sense, you know, there's something very special about MNIST because it's, it's something we use at a high level to communicate uh, as humans, handwritten digits, uh, that that uh, you know is meaningful in its own right, but there are these different types of data, and uh, what I want to press on in this talk is uh, types of data like on the right hand side here. So in particular, uh, you might ask, uh, what do I really mean by ab initio data? We're going to say a little bit more about each of these different types of ab initio data on the next slide, but basically by, by uh, ab initio data, what I mean is data with definitions, data uh, that ar is arrived at by some instantiation of some abstract definition. And, and you might be uh, wanting to characterize this as ML for math. Uh, and that's uh, fine a bit for sure, because we can certainly do machine learning for math. But really uh, this is in the context of ML for subjects, uh, really any subject that has rich mineable theoretical data where the data is arrived at uh, from instantiations of some abstract de definition. Okay. In particular, uh, this ab initio data that's sort of the center of this talk, generally these are large or infinite sets. Uh, the data is complex in some ways that can be touched onto with complexity theory and computer science, and the data is also structured, and we want to ask various different types of questions about this abstract large structured data. Of course, this is uh, something that we heard about ab initio everything in the first talk from Fiala Shanahan in February. Uh, at at IFI, uh, we're interested in ab initio everything. Basically, what that means is that uh, a theme of our institute is to advance knowledge of fundamental interactions using innovative methods in AI built upon ab initio physics principles. For instance, like symmetries uh, in, in Fiala's talk played a role in the context of normalizing flows and equivariance related to, to QCD and Yang Mills theory. Um, and, and similarly, want, we want these ab initio principles to also influence uh, advancing foundations in AI. But uh, the point that I'm making today is that ab initio is more than uh, uh, just about the techniques we use. It's, it can also be about the data that we use. Okay, so here are some examples. On the left, we have some sort of graph that's some sort of decorated graph with various different uh, Greek and Latin letters uh, attached to it. Uh, and, you know, there's apparently different types of nodes in this graph. But this decorated graph is, is uh, what some people call a quiver gauge theory. And so this is something that we use in theoretical particle physics uh, to represent different gauge sectors that could be extensions of the standard model, or more generally could be something that we want to study abstractly independent of any implications for particle physics or cosmology. But, you know, this is structured data and there's enormous sets of these and they're constrained and they're also complex. This chirality property that is a, a, a true thing about fermions in the real world uh, also actually makes it hard to construct these theories in certain cases due to anomaly cancellation, due to quantum consistency of the theory. On the other hand, uh, something I study a lot but won't talk about at all today are kalabi manifolds. So kalabi manifolds are of fundamental interest in uh, string theory and algebraic geometry. They can have many different dimensions. Typically in string theory, we study six dimensional or eight dimensional kalabi manifolds. One thing that's interesting about them is that these kalabi manifolds can have different topological types, different topology uh, from one to the other. And uh, you can actually go through topology changing transitions where you develop a singularity in the manifold and then you do something to it that takes you to a different kalabi -Yau. So in this context, you can think of these higher dimensional manifolds as nodes in a graph and edges between them represent simple topological transitions. And so there's some very, very complicated graph structure here uh, that represents the entire network of kalabi manifolds, if you'd like. And uh, that network structure is, is something that can be studied concretely. And uh, in fact, in certain cases that are of great interest to, to myself and some other people in the audience, the number of appropriately defined uh, kalabi manifolds, something called an elliptic vibration, is finite. But it's finite, but there's actually at least 10 to the 755 of them. So this is some enormous structured data set that we'd like to understand mathematically and that we'd like to understand the implications for the string theory. Okay. 
And finally, the thing that I'm going to focus on in this talk is mathematical knots. This figure will make a reappearance later. Uh, but a crucial thing that we'll study is that some of the knots here can be untangled without ripping or tearing the knot into a circle, whereas others are actually non-trivial. They cannot be untangled into a circle without ripping or tearing. So those are some examples of ab initio data. That is the, uh, the, the high level motivation for my, uh, my own focus in this area. I think it's interesting to ask, what are the large structured theoretical data sets that arise in mathematics or in theoretical physics? And how can we use machine learning to advance our knowledge of those? So today it's all gonna be about knots, uh, a, a particular example of ML for ab initio data. First of all, I'm gonna introduce some elements of knot theory. And then I'm going to talk about whether we can learn to unknot. And uh, there's two aspects to that. There's a supervised learning problem, which is to ask, is this representative of a knot trivial or not as a binary classification? But then we'll actually use reinforcement learning to actually find a sequence of moves uh, that takes you from one knot to an equivalent knot that then trivializes it a lot in the long run so that reinforcement learning can actually do the untangling process. And finally, I'll speak on some, some work in progress with, with Sergey and Fabian and Piotr about what I'd like to call the gem, general topological problem. Uh, all of this is sort of in the context uh, of can we use machine learning to automate aspects of topology as much as possible. But in particular, uh, the general topological problem is basically about trying to automatically learn to whatever extent possible uh, equivalence classes uh, uh, of topologically equivalent objects. And in this context, we'll do it in the context of knots. So let's get started with an overview of knot theory. Let's talk a little bit about knots as natural language. And in particular, these topological objects will be, be represented as words of an appropriate type. So let's begin with a knot. This is uh, the famous trefoil knot, which is it, this knot and its mirror are the simplest non-trivial knots. They have three crossings. You can see that there's a crossing here and a crossing there and a crossing there. And one thing that you can do with this trefoil is you can say, I'd like to cut this trefoil here and I'm gonna cut it here and then I'm gonna take those endpoints and stretch them out. And when you cut it here and take those endpoints and stretch it out, the thing that you end up with is a braid object like this. So when we cut a knot, it becomes a braid representative of the knot. And we'll talk about how to go the other direction in a moment. But the crucial aspect here is that uh, this braid has some sort of moves associated with it, where I take the top strand and I cross it over the, uh, over the bottom strand, call this move sigma one. And then I do that same thing again. I take the top strand and I cross it over the bottom strand, and then I do it again. So we'll say more about this in a moment, but you could represent this notion of bringing the top one over the bottom one by an object that I'll call sigma one. And so this braid is represented by the sequence sigma one, sigma one, sigma one. So we take knots, we cut them, that turns it into a braid representative, and then we can have a braid represented by a word like that. So just concretely, one more time for the trefoil, this old friend from the first slide, we take the trefoil, we cut it in a particular way. It's a braid, but then the, uh, the simplest data encoding of this braid is just via the three integers, one, one, one. So you've seen one, one, one in order many times in your life, but you didn't probably realize that that is, that is a particular encoding of the data uh, uh, of the trefoil knot. And actually it's complete. All of the information of, of the trefoil knot uh, is, is uh, captured by this encoding. You can do many different things with that that compute topological invariants and whatnot, but, but, but the information is there. Okay, more about braids. Well, braids also form a group. So in particular, uh, this was the operation sigma one that I had before that brings the top strand over the bottom strand. You might imagine that the other thing you could do is bring the bottom strand over the top strand like this, yes? And lo and behold, if you bring the bottom strand over the top strand and then bring the top strand over the bottom strand, you can take that object and pull it and turn it into what we call the identity. And so in particular, this operation, sigma, uh, this operation is the inverse of this operation. So we call it sigma one inverse. And you can move on, you can take, uh, this is a three-stranded braid and you can compose them. So this is, uh, uh, in this case, we'll need different subscripts, right? Uh, because I have three strands, one, two, three, 
taking the first strand over the second or taking the second strand over the third, those are two different things. And in particular, we can compose them into a braid like this. And also this, these operations are, are associative. So uh, in particular, uh, braids form a group called the braid group. Now, uh, braids in the braid group, there can be uh, equivalence between braids, topologically speaking. So I'll just show you uh, an example. In this example here, I have, uh, I have uh, this braid and this braid, and you can see uh, that in this picture, by swapping this crossing with this crossing, pulling this one forward to here and pulling this one backward to here, I haven't ripped or torn the braid at all, and, but in particular, what I've done is I've changed the order of these letters in the word. So instead of sigma one before sigma three, I now have action sigma three before sigma one. And what that tells us is that topologically, one, three, two is the same as three, one, two. So some of the generators of this braid group are commuting, but not all of them. And similarly, there's, there's a second braid relation. If you stare at this for a moment, uh, you can convince yourself that these are topologically equivalent braids. You can rearrange uh, one into the other without ripping or tearing. And uh, part of the point is, is that you can represent that also as a relationship between the different types of words that exist in the braid group. Okay, but that was a, an aside about braids. Remember that I'm interested in braids in this talk because I'm interested in knots. So I'm gonna come back to this. How can I form a knot from a braid? So we formed a braid from a knot by cutting it, but you can go the other direction too. You can take a braid like this and you can do something called forming its closure, which is taking this point and connecting it to here, taking this point and connecting it to here, and to taking this point and connecting it to here. Alternatively, just identifying the endpoints of the braid. And you can see in this context, there's no longer endpoints. You have formed some closed object that itself is a knot. So you can turn braids back into knots by a process called closure. And in particular, the same knot can be represented as the closure of many different braids. Okay, so if we can turn braids into knots, you might ask, um, can I get knot equivalences of braid closures? So if I do one of these braid relations that I talked about a moment ago on any given braid, and then I take the closure, that gives you equivalent braids. But you can also have knot equivalents uh, of, of braids that themselves are different. So in particular, two different braids, if you take their closure, can be topologically equivalent. One of them, this, this uh, one of them corresponds to taking an element of a word at the endpoint one and moving it down here. I won't go too much into this figure, but I'll actually encourage you to visualize with me what happens in this figure. So if I if I didn't have this piece of the braid, if I if, if I just had this piece in the upper left of this little box that I'm drawing, that's one braid. But this procedure here weaves in a new strand. So the first braid, which is the the first three uh, strands up to here. So this little upper left box is different than the total braid. On the other hand, if I talk about forming the closure, capping off these endpoints in this way, that one to that one, that one to that one, that one to that one, and so on, you can see that the capping off here uh, just corresponds to some little loop, some little loop here that I could just untwist and it would trivially turn it back into the other knot associated with the closure of, of this upper left braid. So, so there are these different types of moves that you can do to braids that when you uh, form the closure, ensure uh, that the, the, the knots associated with the closure are topologically equivalent. And these are called Markov moves, okay? So we have different types of moves that we can do to braids that preserve the topology of, of the associated knot. And so the upshot of all of this is when you think of knots as braids, well, the braids can be represented by words, just a sequence of integers, and then not uh, equivalence becomes equivalence between different types of words, between different words. So uh, how do we determine in machine learning when two words carry the same meaning, or, or maybe more generally, when two sentences in some natural language carry the same meaning? Well, this is the domain of natural language processing. And my email keeps pinging, uh, so I'm gonna see if I can turn it off real quick. There it is, good. So this is the domain of natural language processing. So uh, I'm only gonna use one NLP technique today, but I'm, I'm going to, to mention it in some depth because even though the problem I'll address with MLP techni NLP techniques are, uh, is a particularly simple problem and it's really overkill for that problem, 
The natural structure of braids is the structure of language because the braids are represented by sequences of integers. So in natural language processing, we're interested in learning semantics between words. So in particular, if you have a, a word embedding E that embeds a word into a vector space, we sometimes uh, have learned models that, that learn semantic relationships between the words. So for example, the embedding of the word king minus the embedding of the word man plus the embedding of the word woman is sometimes roughly equivalent in the learned embedding to the embedding of the word queen, okay? So king minus man plus woman equals queen in the embedding. Alternatively, uh, famously last year, there's generative language models, and, e and even before, of course, GPT-3 was not the first, but many of us had our imaginations captured by GPT-3, and I just included one example here. The bold is a human written prompt. Below is a screenplay for a film noir hard-boiled detective story by so-and-so about Harry Potter, right? And uh, the rest is generated by GPT-3, just given this prompt. So given this prompt, a generative natural language model uh, out of OpenAI called GPT-3 last year, you know, produces the rest of this. You know, a small, dingy office, early morning, furniture of the Salvation Army store variety, so on and so forth. And at the end, uh, there's this funny bit that says, a young man in a double-breasted gray suit is leaning against the building. Harry sighs and goes out the door. He walks up to the young man and without ceremony punches him in the jaw. And there's many other examples online of uh, impressive things that GPT-3 has done. But, uh, but this is one of them, and I, and I like Harry Potter, so I, I like to present this one. So, so there's tremendous strides in natural language processing. And so you might ask, can, can you think of uh, natural language processing and, and braids or not theory as, as going together? So one thing that you might ask is, can we learn commutativity and non-commutativity? So uh, in natural language, he's sometimes right and sometimes he's right are sort of effectively the same thing. You could think of these as some commutivity of the generators of our braid words. Alternatively, sometimes our braid word generators don't commute, and in natural language, it can be important to learn this as well. So the scientist eats the chicken is not equal to the chicken eats the scientist. Alternatively, uh, you might want to learn uh, equivalences. Uh, so the scientist read the paper, and the paper uh, was read by the scientists, are so roughly equivalent. And uh, these are the sorts of things that, that natural language can be good for. Okay, okay. so um, <clears throat> let's actually tackle a concrete problem. So what I want to describe to you now is, is a concrete problem in knot theory called the unknot problem. And uh, this is based on uh, work with Sergey and Fabian and Piotr uh, called Learning to Unknot that was just recently published in Machine Learning Science and Technology. So first of all, we're going to do a supervised learning problem with transformers, and we're going to see some emergent notions of hardness, and then we'll do reinforcement learning for explicit unknotting. So the unknot problem is the following. If I give you a knot, or some representative of a knot, like this one here, you want to ask, is it the unknot? The unknot is the topologically trivial knot. This is a topologically trivial knot. It's just a circle. And the question of the unknot problem is, given some complicated representative like this, can I do, you know, can I, can I move these pieces around? Can I do these moves to the, to the knot that, by definition, are, by, by construction of the moves, aren't going to rip or tear it? Can I do some sequence of moves that takes me from this to this? And if the answer to that is yes, then uh, one says that this, this knot, even though the representative looks complicated, this actually is the unknot because there's a sequence of moves that you can do that turns this into this. Alternatively, uh, in this case, uh, uh, you, you might find some representative of knots that are truly non-trivial that no matter what you do, you cannot uh, reduce it to a circle. Uh, and that's because the knot is non-trivial. So the unknot problem just asks, is a given representative of a knot, uh, uh, um, sorry, given a representative of a knot, can you determine whether or not that knot is topologically trivial? Is it the unknot? The unknot is the topologically trivial knot. And there's a lot of interesting things to say uh, uh, along that direction uh, related to topological invariance that I'll leave out. But the crucial thing that you uh, might, might want to ask is, is there some topological invariant that you can compute quickly that definitively determines whether or not a given representative of a knot is the unknot, okay? A and uh, the answer is, is that no known fast invariant uh, exists that allows you to detect the unknot. Uh, so right before the, 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 the pandemic, uh, uh, my first child was born and uh, many of you might have kids as well. And so I was, uh, inspired to put a little game in one of the appendix. We call the game Not or Not. And, uh, you know, it, it's actually way too hard for kids. 
But the basic point of the game is to illustrate the complexity of, of, of the unknot problem. So here are a bunch of knots. These knots are clearly more complicated than these knots. They have uh, more crossings. That's part of what makes them more difficult. And the game is, given a particular one of these, can you untangle it to a circle without ripping or tearing it, OK? So uh, for your interest later, if you want to look back, the solutions are down here. Uh, this is figure 14, and this is figure 16. So just as a concrete example, uh, this is a topologically trivial knot. Looking at this one, it's very easy to take a moment. I'll give you a moment. And ask yourself if you can untangle it. And it's pretty clear that you can. On the other hand, there is no amount of moving this around that you can do without ripping or tearing that will allow you to untangle this knot, and that's because it's untrivial. This is an unknot, this is a knot. Okay. And the point is, is that the difficulty increases with the number of crossings. So this, this problem, uh, it's not known whether or not the problem is in P, uh, but the difficulty is certainly increasing with the number of crossings to the extent that at some point it's gonna become rather intractable. So we're going to want to uh, have some data so that we can uh, try to understand uh, whether or not we can solve this unknot problem with machine learning. And so in particular, because this is ab initio data, it's defined by definitions. There's an infinite number of potential knots that you could write down that are topologically inequivalent. And given that fact, uh, the question is, how are we going to sample and generate training data for our ML algorithms? So we have two uh, priors that we, uh, two algorithms for coming up with knots and unknots that uh, we, we came up with in our paper. Uh, there are various different uh, things that are interesting about these algorithms, but the basic idea is that we start, uh, we form unknots, we form topologically trivial knots by starting with the empty braid and doing sequences of moves, which generates a long string of integers. By construction, we know that we could collapse it back down but given the long sequence, it's hard to figure out, sorry, given, given the long set of integers, it's hard to figure out which sequence of moves will collapse it down. Similarly, uh, the, the not problem, you can basically just draw a bunch of random integers from some distribution and form a long string of them, and then do something uh, to it uh, to make sure that, it, that, it's, that it's a not and not a link. Uh, but, but these are uh, two algorithms from which we can generate lots of knots and unknots so that we can tackle some of these ML problems. Um, so something that we're going to use is, is something called a, a, a reformer architecture. So you may have heard of the uh, attention mechanism. This is a famous paper, Attention is All You Need, from, from uh, 2017. And uh, this was a uh, significant step forward, I think, uh, this paper and related papers in, in the natural language processing literature. And, and what it allows you to do roughly, the attention mechanism learns what in the sequence carries the, the most meaning. That is, it's, it's an architecture that helps you learn uh, which part of a sentence to really pay attention to. Okay. And there was, a, there was a paper last year called Reformer, the Efficient Transformer, uh, that uh, basically is a, a, a speed improvement on the attention mechanism using something called a locality sensitive hash that uh, isn't actually crucial to get into for this talk. The basic story is that uh, in, the, in, in some of the uh, matrices that uh, arise naturally in the attention mechanism in this scaled dot product attention, uh, these matrices are often very sparse. And what the locality sensitive hash does is allow you to have a way to uh, try to ignore things that, that are sparse. Okay, so, so uh, given this, um, given this uh, these algorithms that we have for generating knots and unknots, you can just ask yourself, can you do the most simple thing? Can we get a neural network to solve the binary classification problem given uh, a large training set of, of knots and of unknots equally weighted? Uh, can we train a neural network to determine whether a given sequence of integers is topologically trivial or not? Right? So uh, in this context, what, what we did was we trained on thousands of knots and unknots with different numbers of crossings. Uh, so in particular, in, in, in uh, this plot, n is, uh, n is the number of crossings. And uh, then, then uh, given both feedforward neural networks and these transformer architectures, we, we try to solve the binary classification problem. And there's a lot of different things that I could say here about these plots. Uh, in the interest of time and wanting to get to sort of the general problems, maybe I'll just comment that uh, the NLP wins uh, in, in, in the sense that 
uh, we're getting 97% uh, accuracy on average with the reformers and something more like 95 or 96, but it barely wins uh, with, with uh, over the feed forward net. So, so apparently uh, one takeaway from this is that for this particular problem, using the NLP architectures is already just overkill. The feed forward nets are doing quite well on, uh, on determining whether the knots are topolo topologically trivial or not. Okay. Um, on the other hand, so there, there was something that we noticed that the, the, uh, uh, the performance went up with N in a way that uh, was surprising. Um, uh, and we did some additional experiments related to that. And we don't think that that's a particularly robust result. But um, just for sort of the order one question about the unknot problem, can you train a neural network to solve the binary classification? The answer is yes. And uh, though the natural language processing techniques are doing marginally better, feed forward nets are actually quite good. Um, so, so for me, this is just a little bit of takeaway that this is not the hardest knot theory problem in the world. In fact, it's, it's one of the most fundamental, but it, but it might be uh, on the rather simple side. Okay. On the other hand, you might, you might ask, uh, are there notions uh, of hardness and does it learn any topological correlations that we might know about from knot theory? Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this slide except to say that there were some knots that were consistently misidentified in the binary classification problem. And uh, while I don't know of any, uh, any sort of rigorous notions of hardness in the knot theory literature, uh, that uh, the idea being that, you know, are there some classes of knots that with respect to some particular problem you might ask about them are fundamentally harder to compute? But there certainly is uh, anecdotal evidence out there in, uh, in the literature uh, that some knots are harder than others, at least at the level of it took humans a lot longer to answer a particular question uh, about a knot than, than, than about other knots. So there was a, a famous story of the last couple of, couple of years um, out, of, uh, 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 out of something called the Conway knot, and uh, the result is due to Lisa Pecarillo of MIT. And uh, there was this particular knot, and there was a particular question that topologists wanted to ask about it for decades, and they weren't able to answer this question, even though the knot was relatively simple. And even though under the notion of simpleness associated with the number of crossings, uh, it had basically been answered about most of the other ones. And uh, uh, that topological invariant was uh, computed and the question was answered a year or two ago after sort of decades of, of not being able to answer the question. So, so uh, we noticed that our ML techniques, even though it's, it's quite empirical and heuristic, there were some knots that were consistently misidentified by, by the neural networks. And finally, there's a very famous topological invariant called the Jones polynomial that high energy theorists study a lot. Uh, it's a particular polynomial invariant of a knot. There's whole classes of polynomial invariants of knots. And uh, this, this uh, given the binary classification problem, you can ask, how does the uh, confidence of the network in its prediction that something is topologically non-trivial correlate with known topological invariants? And so in particular, uh, as, the, uh, as the output is going down, 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 the network is more and more confident that the, uh, that the representative of the knot is topologically non-trivial. And we saw a direct correlation with the degree of the Jones polynomial of those knots. So this was something that was interesting to us because this is a particularly uh, famous topological invariant. And this was something, this correlation was something that was learned uh, by the architecture. That in particular, the Jones polynomial was not used in training whatsoever. Okay. So that's kind of some, some technical stuff. And in general, uh, you know, binary classification is sort of like the first thing you do for some problem you care about, but there's much more interesting versions of most problems. And, and that's what I want to, to talk about now. So uh, better than asking, given a sequence of integers, is the associated knot to that sequence of integers non-trivial? You might ask, can I explicitly find the sequence of moves that I can do on those integers that collapses it to nothing? That is, that takes the complicated looking uh, uh, braid or uh, knot and actually find the sequence of moves that re reduces it to the circle that explicitly shows that it's the unknot. Can we explicitly unknot a representative of a given knot? That's the question. So for this, in our work, we use reinforcement learning. Uh, this is a context that uh, many of you are probably familiar with, but I, I'll review it just in case. So reinforcement learning is very different from supervised learning, at least, uh, at least in schematic. The basic idea that you should have in your mind here is, is that an agent interacts in some environment. Uh, think of that agent as a little computer robot, like here. And that, uh, as it goes around its environment, it perceives a state from state space. So this robot's goal is to 
to explore state space. And it explores state space according to some policy function, which is a map from the set of states to the set of possible actions. And so what the policy does is it picks an action given the state. The robot, after taking the action associated with whatever the policy chose, it arrives in a new state and receives a reward. And successive rewards across many time steps, steps accumulate into something called a return, uh, where future rewards might be penalized by a discount, because uh, in some types of problems, uh, you know, future rewards are less valuable than, than current rewards. Uh, and there's something called uh, state and action value functions, which are expectation values of the return given the state or expectation values of the return given the state and the action together. Okay. But so the basic idea is to try to have some little computer robot that learns how to explore a system and uh, over time, based on receiving reward, updates how it makes decisions in order to try to, to perform, uh, perform the task better. Uh, one of the most famous examples of, of this is AlphaZero. So in uh, 2017, uh, Silver et al. published Mastering the Game of Go Without Human Knowledge. Uh, and um, you know, part of the point of AlphaZero relative to the original AlphaGo is that this was reinforcement learning that used no human data. So it was reinforcement learning where uh, the agents were taught the rules of the game, the rules of the environment, and what actions were possible and what uh, and what uh, states were, that is states are the board positions and given a board position, the actions are the allowed, allowed moves in chess, for instance. And given just the rules, it, 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 uh, it mastered the game uh, via self-play without any human intervention uh, in the sense of training on grandmaster games that were actually played by real humans. Okay. Uh, so so uh, AlphaZero is a, is a very famous result uh, uh, in reinforcement learning. And as someone who's a big fan of chess, I actually find it uh, particularly exciting and interesting. Uh, one thing that's interesting about reinforcement learning is that because you can take the trained agent and have it play the game, that is follow some trajectory or rollout through state space associated with the trained agent, it lends some notion of interpretability if you have some context to cast it into. So in particular, because I know how to play chess, I am neither terrible nor great, but I'm good enough that when I see a game of AlphaGo, or sorry, of AlphaZero playing Stockfish, I can recognize that it's playing differently than Stockfish itself plays. And so there's even books on this in addition, it started with YouTube videos, of course, but there's even books on this now about how AlphaZero plays chess. And it's possible because the trained agent actually plays games and people that know how to play chess have context for evaluating what it's doing. Okay, so how are we going to do this? We want reinforcement learning. We want to have some little agent that learns how to take this sequence of integers and do the moves that preserve the topology of the knot such that the sequence of integers collapses to zero. That is such that uh, you, you unknot the knot. So uh, the, uh, the state space of this system are zero padded grades of length 2n. There's a particular action space of dimension n plus 5, <coughs> where n is the length of the braid word. There are some moves that we have. We can shift left, we can shift right. We can perform these braid relations and shift right. Uh, we can do these Markov moves. Markov moves are moves that change the structure of the braid, but preserve the topology of the knot. And then there's something that we came up with called, called smart collapse that tries to sort of iteratively collapse down as much as possible in a deterministic way. The reward in this case, uh, because the goal is to collapse the sequence of integers to nothing, the reward is the negative braid length. So technically this is sort of the punishment. Uh, the longer the braid word, the more the agent is getting punished. So it is being incentivized to shorten the length of the braid word and choose actions that over time will shorten the length of the braid word. The end of the game, the end of the game, if you'd like, was when you arrived at the empty braid, that is, you found the unknot, or alternatively after 300 moves. So just for the sake of time, we don't let it do more than 300 moves. And we used a couple of different reinforcement learning algorithms. <clears throat> so here are the results. Um, the results of this game are that reinforcement learning wins. Uh, the random walker is terrible, and so a particular reinforcement learning algorithm called trust region policy optimization is just incredible. So this, this is the plot. Um, so in particular, what we did was we uh, gave the trained agents uh, uh, some uh, representatives that they hadn't seen before, and we asked, can you find the unknot? And in particular, given that end of game is defined by finding the unknot, the empty braid, or, uh, or 300 moves, we asked what fraction of the time is it able to do that? Which, which, what fraction of the time is it able to, to simplify it? 
as a function of the length of the braid. So the idea is, is that as the braid gets longer and longer and longer, you expect the performance of a random walker to go down very quickly because it's just randomly picking loops. And that's what we see. The fraction of the braids that it successfully unknots for, I think this is like a length 12 braid, is a little above 60% for a random walker. But as you see, as you increase the length of the braid and therefore the number of crossings of the associated knot, it just goes down very, very rapidly. And, and up at 96, it's not doing so well. Uh, on the other hand, uh, A3C is a famous reinforcement learning algorithm called an asynchronous advantage actor critic. Uh, this algorithm is doing pretty well and it's clearly being the random walker. But trust region policy optimization is sort of maintaining 80% level uh, success rate on actually untangling um, uh, uh, these, these knots, uh, even as n increases from 12 to 24 to 48 and so on up to 96. Okay. So uh, the reinforcement learning, the, the punchline is, is that it is successfully learning to uh, find the sequence of moves that trivializes the unknot representatives. Okay. And uh, there's some things about interpretability, but uh, it's not as crucial as what I want to say next. So I'll leave it there and try to leave time for questions. So what I want to end my talk with is, is uh, some work in progress that uh, I think this is the first time I'm actually presenting it. So that's, that's fun. Uh, so this is about what I would call the general topological problem. Um, and I'll say what that means, but the basic idea is we want to, as much as possible, have automated learning of topological equivalence classes and then actually do it in the case of knots. So, so can machine learning automate topology? Um, so uh, a classic example uh, of topology that we love to give in talks is, is compact Riemann surfaces. So the, the surface of a donut and the surface of a coffee cup uh, are topologically equivalent in the sense that you can take the coffee cup and if imagining it were made of rubber and pliable and you could reach down into the bottom, pop it out and shape it into a donut without ripping or tearing. Put differently, uh, <clears throat> there's one hole in the coffee cup and there's one hole in the donut. And that property in the context of this type of object is sufficient to ensure that you can deform one into the other. On the other hand, there's no holes in the basketball, in the surface of the basketball. And because of that, uh, this uh, coffee cup and this donut are topologically equivalent while neither of them are topologically equivalent to the basketball. Okay, so this is, this is the, back to a high level concept. Topology, roughly speaking, topology is a very beautiful subject, but it's roughly about equivalence classes of object under certain types, is, types of deformations. And from a machine learning perspective, that's a, it's a pretty natural question to ask, can you learn a, a latent space embedding that encodes topological equivalence of objects, ideally into tight clusters where things that are topologically equivalent are clustered together and where the clusters are well separated in the latent space. <clears throat> and uh, this is a fairly general framework for thinking about how you might tackle topology with machine learning. Uh, and one thing that you might be after is some sort of, sort of complete topological invariant where, where given uh, the invariant thing encoded in the clustering, uh, that is actually sufficient to, to uniquely determine the topology of the object. So, so an example of a complete topological invariant in this case uh, is the number of holes. So the number of holes for, for a, a compact Riemann surface, a compact uh, two manifold of this variety uh, is entirely determined by the number of holes. So that's a complete topological invariant. Okay. So, so I'm interested in this general question because if you could make real progress in topology in a sort of a systematic way with machine learning, it would be very exciting. So here's a general schematic for how you might think about that, about learning topological equivalences. Um, lots of possible ways are out there to do this. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's basically similarity learning and machine learning. And the basic idea is that the input to the algorithms uh, would be some set of representatives of some topological equivalence class. So this, this is a set of D objects labeled E, K1 through E, K, D that are all in the same topological equivalence class. So this is a set of objects that if your latent space clustering is working, these objects get clustered together, okay? On the other hand, you might let K itself go from one to N so that you have D representatives of N different topological equivalence classes, which if life was perfect and everything was working well, would give you in some latent space learned representation of the topology, it would give you uh, n different clusters where the clusters have d elements each. And you, the goal would be to maximally squash down the clusters while maximally separating them. Okay. Then you would toss that into some problem relative to architecture. So I think uh, 
Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of what we did first. In the long run, for harder knot theory problems, one might need to use NLP directly. And then you have some sort of output and loss for equivalence. So uh, there's something called the triplet loss that is a, a natural thing to do. The basic idea is that what goes in is a triplet, A, P, and N. A is called the anchor. P is uh, a positive thing that's supposed to cluster with A, and N is a negative thing that's not supposed to cluster with A. And the, the goal of, uh, of learning with the triplet loss is to minimize the distance of, of the positive to the anchor while maximizing the distance of the negative to the anchor. On the other hand, we did something much simpler, uh, which was to, for each, uh, for each member of an equivalence class, pick a distinguished member and then require that all representatives of that class reconstruct that member at output, uh, hoping that in the last layer, that latent layer, that clustering will sort of naturally occur. So in the context of, uh, of our setup, uh, we're going to try to learn topological equivalence for knots. There's, okay, so there's, there's some architecture. Uh, I won't go into details I, uh, other than to note the most important thing is that we're going to double up the braid word and then throw it through a convolutional layer of size n and stride one, okay? So this is a relevant architecture because if the trefoil is represented in this way, this is one representation of the trefoil knot. If we double it up, the input to the algorithm is like this. But then we have a length n convolutional filter with stride one so that it passes down the braid. And crucially, any consecutive four element subset of this eight vector is, uh, is a, a different representation. It's a different translation representation of the actual knot. So when you translate the knot around the corner, when you translate the braid around the corner, it gives you an equivalent knot by this move that I mentioned earlier. And this is, uh, a way of baking this into the architecture. And this is actually something that, that's useful for the learning. Uh, so what, what we try to do is uh, after going through conv, uh, we, ha we, we uh, have a, a dense layer going up to size 300 and then a dense down to some latent space dimension and then to output and we do the mean absolute error on the reconstruction. Okay, okay. so uh, we have uh, a bunch of different training details. Um, there's 200 equivalence classes of knots in this context, realized as five strand length 12 braids. There's 12 representatives from each class. There's uh, each of them is five moves from the initial knot. And uh, the embedding dimension in this context, we tried a couple of different ones. We tried six, four, and two. Um, interestingly, we found that uh, uh, you know you could do pretty darn well with two. We had a 90-10 test train split, 400 epics. Trains in a minute or two. This is just very preliminary results trying to, to get some basic sense of what's going on. So those are the training details. Uh, in terms of clustering, the goal is that we want to cluster trained uh, latent representations of the braids. Uh, and in particular, what we want is that uh, in, in the latent space, the uh, topologically equivalent objects are clustered together and uh, they're, they're well separated for topologically inequivalent things. So. This was a very, very simple case with uh, where we did principal component analysis with embedding dimension four. Uh, these are the first two principal components. And you can see already in this case, uh, light colors are topologically equivalent things. Sometimes there's a little spread, but other times things cluster together pretty darn well just via this simple reconstruction technique. So um, what this PCA analysis motivated us to do was to try to be a little more sophisticated with our clustering it seems like there is some uh, learned latent space representation of topological equivalence going on here. And so uh, we tried to do uh, consensus and hierarchical clustering to be, to be a little sharper. So uh, given some uh, particular case uh, in, in a number of different cases, uh, what we did was we tried to, uh, we did consensus clustering using k-means on, uh, on um, the latent space data, on the latent space vectors that represent the latent space embedding of a given knot. And uh, then we did hierarchical clustering on the consensus matrix so that you can sort of see easily which things are being clustered together, right? So the consensus clustering is telling us which knots cluster together uh, uh, when you recluster with a 90% fraction a number of times. Uh, that, that's what consensus clustering is. And, and you can see that, that um, uh, you know, the clustering is happening in, in some reliable way. This is the untrained data and this is the trained data. But the question isn't whether clustering is happening, it's that is the latent space clustering arrived at via, via uh, these clustering algorithms, is it consistent with the ground truth topological labels of the topologically equivalent knots? So the ground truth is on the axes in these cases. And uh, basically when you see a block like this, 
Uh, it is, uh, this means that these are latent space representations that are clustering together a large fraction of the time. And uh, when you compare it to ground truth, you see that all of these have the same color. That is, these are all uh, not from the same topological equivalence class where uh, the learned latent space representation is naturally clustering them together. So put differently, the learned latent space representation is capturing the topological invariance. There's other cases where there are some interesting impurities. So you can see here that uh, orange and purple are the ground truth labels here for this block of things that are clustering together. And uh, there's a lot of orange in there and a little bit of purple, but actually it's, it's kind of interesting because there's only two colors. So one thing that we haven't uh, checked yet is to make sure that all of these, that, that, that purple and, and orange are actually topologically distinct knots. Uh, that's, that's something that we'll do. But the, the upshot of these, uh, of these ground truth labels is that you never see streaks of color over here. So the things that are clustering together in the untrained latent space don't correlate in any meaningful way with the actual topological, uh, uh, topological labels of the knots. On the other hand, uh, the latent space clustering after training correlates strongly with the actual topological labels of the knots. That is, uh, topologically equivalent knots are clustering together. OK, um, I want to leave time for questions, so I'll wrap up. Uh, I introduced the notion of knots as ab initio data. Uh, ab initio data for me is just data that is defined by definitions. And if you have data that's defined by definitions, you need some prior distribution over the space of possibilities uh, to sample to generate the data. And that's what we did for knots and for unknots. Uh, we had notions of unknotting hardness uh, that arised in supervised learning. Uh, we saw that when we used this transformer architecture, uh, it was actually just overkill because feed forward nets on binary classification for the unknot problem were already doing very, very, very well. Interestingly, there was a learned correlation uh, between how confident the network was and the degree of the Jones polynomial, which is sort of a measure of how non-trivial the knot is, if you'd like. Uh, but, but more importantly than the supervised learning and the binary classification is that we actually tried to find the sequence of moves that given the braid, which is represented by a sequence of integers, does things to the braid that collapses it down to something trivial. And what we saw in that context is that as the braid word gets longer, random walkers are as expected doing worse and worse and worse. But reinforcement learning is doing much, much better. And the crucial difference is that the random walkers are drawing actions from a uniform distribution that is constant for all times, whereas the uh, reinforcement learning agents learn how to select actions intelligently. And that's, that's what's going on here. And finally, we tried to ask a, a, a sort of a um, optimistic question uh, which, if successful in any degree of generality, would be, I think, pretty important for machine learning for math, which is, can you sort of automatically detect topological equivalence using, using ML? And we saw latent space clustering of these topologically equivalent ob objects, which, which in this case were different representatives of the same knot. But the general conclusion, this, this talk was really about ab initio AI and just one example of it. Uh, the general conclusion is that data is more than what we create or collect. Uh, it can stem directly from definitions, uh, which one might call ab initio data. Uh, and that ab initio data can be enormous and structured. And enormous, one version of enormous is infinite, uh, but sometimes it can be enormous and finite, actually. So there's a data set that I care about that has more than 10 to the 755 elements, but by a 2016 theorem in algebraic geometry, we know that that data set is finite, even though it's enormous. Okay. Uh, and, and furthermore, given this enormous structured data, the, the basic idea here is that machine learning can help us to understand these better. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm excited about that and I hope you are too. So thanks a lot. Um, and I will take questions. Great, Jen. Great talk. R really inspiring. Um, so uh, uh, raise your hand uh, if you're here on Zoom or, or drop questions in the chat. Um, I saw that uh, uh, in the chat, I'll just uh, read out a question from Ning Bao. Um, yeah. Uh, so how does your, your algorithm, uh, in terms of your reinforcement algorithm, how does that compare to the best current classical algorithms for the unknotting procedure? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't know. We, we didn't compare to the best unknown, uh, sorry, the best classical algorithms out there. Um, and then uh, from, from Ruth Corin, uh, can you speak a little bit more about the interpretation about how the knots are being unknotted in the RL example? 
Um, in, in the same in the same way that, that you as a as a chess player, you know, know what it looks like when when you know Alpha Zero plays yeah. chess. What are you learning about the way that RL is doing the unknotting compared to you know what your child might do for the unknotting? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, right, right. So, so a child at first is a random walker, and eventually the child is a reinforcement learning agent, <laughs> you know, it has rewards and whatnot, and, and updates. But, but at least it's a random walker to start with. So, um, Ruth, that's a great question. So, one thing that we did, I'm, I'm sort of emphasizing in generality that given a trained reinforcement learning agent, you might there, whether it leads to meaningful interpretability is another question, but there's always something to try with respect to interpretability. And that's to take the trained agent and take some very large number of rollouts of that agent and then look at how is it that the trained agent is uh, selecting moves on average uh, relative to moves that the random walker would suggest. So that's what we did. Um, so the untrained alg algorithm here is the orange dots and the trained one is, is the blue dots. And so in particular, uh, the untrained guy starts from uniform. There are a bunch of different types of moves that we, uh, that we have. And uh, because we, the untrained agent draws from a uniform distribution, it's, it's doing all of those moves roughly an equal percentage of the time up to statistics. And what you can see is that uh, the trained agent is, uh, is doing uh, different types of moves different amounts of the time. So in particular, it learned that this smart collapse is a fairly useful thing to do. Smart collapse is just like a deterministic while loop that keeps doing reducing moves until it can't do, do them anymore. And so it learned that that's a pretty useful thing to do. The sharpest thing though, is that it learned to shift left and it learned to not shift right. Uh, so this is something, doing this more is something that is actually useful, I think. This is useful, I think, only because left versus right is baked into how we chose the actions. So when we do a braid relation, uh, it's useful to move the braid after doing the braid relation one way or the other. We chose to move it to the right. So the natural action space has lots of shift rights built in, right? And so you don't actually need to do a, a, a type two shift right that often because the shift rights are baked in here. So that's why we see this asymmetry between shift left and shift right. And by shift left and shift right, I just mean like, literally take the sequence of integers, move it to the right and bring the endpoint around the corner back to the beginning. Um, so, so this is a context in which I would say, uh, this is something that yes, it learned, but it's th this difference between left and right, but it's something that really is uh, specific to our choice of, of action space. Whereas the smart collapse is something that probably is me use useful in a meaningful way. We commented on a lot of these in our paper and um, you know, sort of have a, a paragraph on interpretability. Um, yeah, so, so just because interpretability is always possible to try in reinforcement learning by a study in rollouts, it doesn't mean that it leads to meaningful things. Um, in the case of chess, uh, I think it does. And in particular, one thing that Alpha Zero really does that even I as a low level player can notice is that Stockfish, the, the best traditionally programmed algorithm, very, very much prioritizes taking pieces whenever it can because material as it's called in chess is worth something. Uh, whereas Alpha Zero has learned to really balance the value of having pieces versus the positioning of the pieces. So Alpha Zero and Stockfish play in noticeably different ways that even an amateur can, can see. And in particular, there's great videos online of, of grandmasters explaining uh, what Alpha Zero is doing differently. Great, uh, Patrick. Yeah, so my question uh, is similar to the one Ruman's asked in the chat here. It's do you understand how your two algorithms that generate these knots are like are sampling the space of knots with n crossings? Because I'm very surprised that as you that you see better performance in some cases with larger n. You see it a little bit here with this TRPO algorithm, and you see it very strongly in your learning to unknot case. And that's yeah. something I would think might be happening if you know there's some uh, repeated aspect of these knots that are they're actually not getting more complicated with n. Yeah. So 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 the the um. Roughly, the most important step in the prior that generates the knots is just drawing random integers where the, you know, what integers you're allowed to draw depends on the number of strands in the braid, okay? So we just generate some long sequence of integers uh, drawing, drawing from a uniform distribution. And, um, you know, uh, that is, um, okay, so that, 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 is, that is how we, that, that's, that's the prior. Um, let me comment on your two questions. So in the case of the increase in N, I don't actually have real intuition. So trust region and policy optimization is a second order method, not a first order method. It's, it's a different type of algorithm than A3C. Um, so I don't really have any intuition except to point out that uh, the random walker in one of the RL algorithms is seeing this decrease with N 
and um, and what the other RL algorithm is is seeing uh, flat performance. So um, you know, uh, I mean, a comment is is that you know if it were something really about the prior that was leading to the huge performance difference, one might expect that that A3C would be a little flatter than this. In the, me, in the case of binary classification, though, you said you don't trust the result fully. I, I, um, I wouldn't quite put it that way. Um, what I would say is that we did two different types of experiments. Uh, in, in, in um, yeah, right. So, so uh, the performance goes up with n. This was the first result that we had. This was really surprising to me, right? Yeah. Um, this is just straight up increasing with n. Um, that is very counterintuitive. Uh, one thing you might notice in that case is because we had a fixed number of samples, what it meant is that uh, the number of letters, because you know the, the number of letters is 12, 24, 36, 48, the number of letters seen by the architecture for fixed number of samples is much larger. So instead we tried, uh, we, we tried doctoring the number of samples and doing experiments where we don't have the same number of samples, but the total number of letters seen by the, uh, the agent is the same. And there it's uh, not the agent, the, the network is the same. And there they're much more on top of each other. So, um, I mean, what this is suggesting is that, um, you know, the, there's a, there's some sort of trade off between the number of samples seen and the uh, and the number of, and the total number of letters seen, um, and um, there's 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 potentially some in, interesting connection to the prior, but I, I'd be speculating a little too much if I went into it. So so when I said I didn't trust it, what I I hope I didn't say that. What I really meant is that. This really drastic result is in the case of the fixed number of samples, where at the different ends, by definition, uh, the, the nets are seeing different numbers of letters overall, whereas this is fixed number of letters, and the results aren't as shocking. Daniel. Thanks. Thanks. So it was really uh, interesting for a not newbie like myself. So. Um, uh, I have two questions. Um, one is might might not be very interesting, but I was wondering if uh, the classification um, uh, seeing if it's an ONAT or not, uh, if if that uh, network could also be used as some sort of prior uh, for the value function of the reinforcement learning network. And my second question is: uh, Is the analogy with language also uh, apparent in the kind of compositionality of language or hierarchy? So maybe you have a subset or uh, of the the braids that um, if you, if you add something to it, that there's some sort of hierarchy to it. Um, so in the first case, you, you want to sort of take some sort of pre-trained binary classification network. And I, I mean, you would somehow have to make the, the architecture, the, the structure of the input and output required for reinforcement learning uh, consistent with what you would do for the binary classification. So there'd have to be, I think you want to take some sort of, some, do some sort of pre-training with the binary classification network and then shoehorn it into RL. Um, we didn't try that. That's, that's, uh, I mean, I, I'd be worried a little bit that the, that, that the massaging you have to do of the architecture uh, is going to introduce enough new weights that it, it, it's not going to be robust. But that, that's an interesting and easy thing to try. Um, in some sense, uh, you know, we, I mean, I guess one thing that was a little surprising to us is that uh, the reinforcement learning worked as well as it did without doing any kind of pre-training, just using feedforward networks. Um, so, so one thing that I didn't... Um, Right. Uh, and maybe, 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 maybe I'll just leave it there. Can you re repeat your second question? Yeah, so uh, I guess language is, uh, has compositionality or some sort of hierarchy where uh, sub-sentences uh, can be moved around or something. Uh, so I was wondering if you see the same uh, in, uh, in braids or not, because you were talking about this subset, uh, this mm -hmm. the square uh, of, of the knot, and I was wondering if you could leverage that somehow that yeah, that there, there are different levels or hierarchies to work with. Yeah, so if we get too much into natural language and linguistics, I'll really stop knowing what I'm talking about. But this idea that subsets matter is, is, is absolutely uh, central to this and you can move things around. So, so these different types of moves that I emphasized are, are, are moves on the braid word that guarantee that the closure is still a topologically equivalent knot. And so indeed, um, you could imagine taking some what one one prior that you could do is take some some little chunk of some non-trivial you know five 
five seven sequence of five integers that represents some some non-trivial knot, and then you could do stuff at the end, right? Uh, which all is encoding trivial moves that don't do anything non-trivial. You could build up some non-trivial sequence, and because of that, really the kernel of truth in that long knot that I generate by taking some small non-trivial knot and doing trivial things that build up the sequence, the kernel of truth is really in that subset. And you can shift that subset around and you can do different moves to it to massage it. And so, yeah, absolutely. I mean, part of the thing that's, that's interesting here is that, um, is that there are definitely sort of uh, subsets of the knot that can potentially be more important than others, depending on the representation. A, a crucial difference though, is that, uh, is that the global structure can, can, can matter. Um, in particular, um, you don't really generate the knot without really closing it around and having periodic boundary conditions. So, um, you know, if you change just one little letter somewhere, it can potentially change the topology of the knot, so. All right, right. thanks. All right, Max, you have a question. Yeah. Um, so, um, thank you again for a really beautiful talk. I'm very on fire about this stuff. Really, really cool. Thanks. When you play chess, it, sometimes you uh, sacrifice a piece, yes. which seems like a short-term bad idea <laughs> maybe to, to someone who's just counting material because that's the key to victory. And, and you could imagine in the same way, there could be situations where uh, it's better to make some weird moves that temporarily makes your string a bit longer because that's going to let you untangle the thing uh, later. So I was wondering if if uh, you could take some more ideas from Alpha Zero and Alpha Go into this, um, then you already have, since it finesses this, you know, so well. So very specifically, if you, uh, it feels like this this uh, proxy for when you look at just the length of your uh, code, that feels a little bit like stockfish counting up, the, you know, the material on the board: three yeah. points for a rook, one point for a pawn. Whereas what, what, what was actually done in Alpha Zero right, was they, they trained a value network, which yeah. is a lot like your first feed forward project, where you look at a knot and the, sort of the value of it, you could take as what it assesses the probability to be that this is the unknot, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 then, and then separate from that, you have this um, whole policy system, whether it be uh, Monte Carlo research or, or, or whatever else. And, and so, so I'm curious, basically, if, if you could unify the first part of your talk and the second part of your talk within something like the Alpha Zero framework and get yeah. even better at solving that. Um, I mean, I mean, it's a, a good, that's a great question to ask. So I should point out, first of all, that we did use these actor critic methods that have value networks built in. But crucially, we didn't do any Monte Carlo tree search, um, just for keeping things simple, no, no principal reason. Um, and you know, we were getting good results without without any Monte Carlo tree search. But um, you know, this question of of uh, what is being learned can be studied by rollouts. So one thing that you could do with what we already have that I don't recall doing is uh, studying. Um, in each of these rollouts, you can study the length of the word, right? So there's some plot that you can make for any given game, which is at, a, at any given time step, uh, what is the length of the word? And indeed, we're encouraging it a priori to be very materialistic in the sense of trying to just minimize the break word. Uh, but um, but uh, it could be that by, by studying the rollouts, you realize that in some cases it has to go up to go down. Uh, 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 co comparing that to alpha zero, I would point out that in some sense, um, you know, the reward, as I recall, is just whether or not it won the game. And so it was materialistic in, in, in that sense. But then how it actually arrives at that is, is part of the, uh, the non-trivial question. Along the way to yes or no, did I win or not at the end, there's a question of whether it prioritizes value from the value network on taking pieces versus on placing them optimally. That was the basic crux of the traditional algorithms versus alpha zero. Um, and, and that's that's something that, uh, that uh, in principle, you could study an analogous thing in our context by this up to go down notion. In our trajectories, what fraction of the time is there a step where it increases the braid length in a meaningful way such that it can open up new angles for going down? Uh, that, that's a very interesting thing to do. One thing I would point out is that there is something called the DT representation of a knot. Uh, 
um, and uh, it's not a braid representation. We did study this a little bit. In certain cases there, it has been proven actually for certain knots uh, in DT representation that you actually have to go up to go down, that, that you sort of get stuck in this metastable minimum and you have to increase the complexity of the representation to be able to reduce it to the trivial, uh, to the trivial knot. Um, and you know we have some results on that in our paper, but uh, generally we found that that representation, which is not quite as amenable to, to natural language techniques, uh, it was not as good of a representation for doing ML with as the brains. So, um, Fascinating. We finally even did this plot the length versus time for a bunch of trajectories and see if it yeah. looks kind of like simulated annealing or if it's just monotonically yeah. decreasing. Yeah, I, I mean, the, na the naive guess is just exactly to sort of systematically try to shorten it, which is sort of the analog of take as many pieces as you can in chess, perhaps. But um, yeah, it would be pretty easy to produce those plots. I, uh, we just didn't do it. So. Cool. Okay, great. Um, I don't see any more questions right now. So let's uh, thank Jim again for, for, for a great colloquium. And then uh, also I wanna thank Jim for organizing a great colloquium series uh, for us in iFi and uh, looking forward to, uh, to more great talks coming up this, uh, this fall. So thanks everyone. Thanks everyone, see you in the fall. <laughs>